Okay, thank you, Professor. I'm here to tell you a couple of words of today's event. You've seen our housekeeping rules. This is just general housekeeping. We will keep the timing of our agenda really sharp. Uh, the meeting runs on Zoom, unfortunately, because our uh, free version of the conference platform is not tested yet completely. Uh, please keep your microphone muted and camera turned off when not speaking. Use please Q&A box for questions. We will try to answer all your questions and please use chat only for immediate communication to share links or to say hellos and so on. Please note that our meeting is uh, recorded. I hope that you're all cozy at home or somewhere else and that you will enjoy the content of our confer conference. And now I will announce um, the plenary lecture of Italo uh, Vignoli titled Libre Office 10th Anniversary, the Many Faces of Global FOSS Community. Italo, siamo molto felici di averla qua. Congratulazioni per l'anniversario di Libre Office. Speriamo che lei possa venire a Belgrado l'anno prossimo. Allora attendiamo con impazienza la sua conferenza plenaria. Um, za oni koji razumeju srpski, uh, radujemo se što imamo plenarno predavanje koje će nam održati Italo Vinjoli povodom godišnjice LibreOffice projekta. Nadamo se da će biti prilike da se ovo predavanje održi uživo, možda već i sledeće godine, i sa nestrpljenjem iščekujemo predavanje. Um, Italo, we are very happy uh, to have you as a speaker. Congrats for the LibreOffice anniversary, and we hope to see you next year in person here in Belgrade. Um, and now we are looking forward a bit impatiently your uh, plenary uh, lecture, so uh, go ahead. Um, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen so you can uh, see my presentation. Okay. And uh, it should be okay, I yes. hope. Perfect. Okay. So I just, uh, um, we, we met one week ago, so I, I updated a little bit the title, but it's not really completely different from, uh, from what it was supposed to be. I will talk about the LibreOffice community in any case. Um, we, uh, we launched uh, LibreOffice uh, more or less 10 years ago on September 28, 2010. But we should consider that 10 years before um, the open office uh, project was born. Uh, we, uh, the community, the open office uh, community was uh, working with Sun, uh, started to work in the year 2000 and uh, uh, we, we went on uh, for 10 years, uh, but uh, we, we started to have some uh, let's say not issues, but some discussions about the evolution of the project. So when uh, in uh, uh, 2010, um, 2009 actually, um, Oracle uh, uh, announced to the acquisition of Sun, the community uh, started to discuss about the opportunity of um, having the project under a different um, home. Uh, and that uh, should be an independent foundation. Uh, actually, the project, uh, uh, the roots of the project go back to 1985 when uh, Marco Burris, uh, he, he was a German student, uh, um, uh, developed Star Writer uh, to write his uh, uh, high school thesis. Uh, the product was successful and uh, become uh, over a few years an office suite. Uh, Star Writer uh, became Star Division. It was based in Hamburg, Northern Germany. Uh, in uh, 1999, uh, Sun acquired Star Division. At the time, uh, uh, the reason was uh, uh, for Sun to have a an office suite uh, running uh, on um, the uh, Sun uh, operating system, so Solaris, uh, because uh, uh, to, to have a productivity machine, 
most of the Sun uh, employees uh, were forced to have also a laptop uh, running Windows uh, to have Microsoft Office. So just by saving that money, that justified the acquisition of the of Star Division. Um, what happened is uh, uh, that Sun decided to release uh, as open source uh, the uh, Star Office uh, code, uh, and uh, that was released uh, as uh, OpenOffice.org in uh, two thousand in the year two thousand. Um, uh, here you see a timeline of the what has happened. In 2010, you see the green uh, LibreOffice starting. Uh, in 2011, uh, uh, of course, uh, LibreOffice is a fork of OpenOffice. And in 2011, uh, we had the Apache OpenOffice fork uh, of uh, OpenOffice. Um, so basically, the OpenOffice project uh, uh, ended uh, uh, in uh, 2010 and uh, 2011, uh, but uh, given that we uh, LibreOffice is using the same uh, copyleft license, uh, um, and uh, while uh, Apache OpenOffice is using uh, the Apache uh, um, license, uh, uh, which is not copyleft. Uh, um, the, the real hair of OpenOffice uh, is uh, LibreOffice. Um, this is more, this is the announcement of Oracle when they acquired Sun. Uh, it was clear immediately that uh, OpenOffice was not uh, a, a strategic uh, acquisition for, uh, for Sun, for Oracle. So we, uh, we basically, what the community did was to uh, revert the, the, the paradigm. Uh, the umbrella culture is Sun uh, protecting the community, in some cases protecting it to the point that people was not allowed to, to do what they wanted, to what the, uh, we, we can call as a mixing bowl culture. So um, uh, something where uh, everyone has to contribute uh, according to his uh, capabilities to provide, uh, to, to push forward the project. And what we did, uh, we relaunched the innovation. OpenOffice uh, was an incredibly innovative project uh, in terms of um, features uh, in the year 2000. I remember that at the time I was looking for a replacement of Microsoft Office. And uh, uh, when I, and there were um, many low cost clones of Microsoft Office, but none of them was a real good uh, software. And then I, I found uh, OpenOffice and I realized that OpenOffice had a distinctive advantage over the other uh, clones of Microsoft Office because it was a product uh, with a with a soul with a with its own uh, uh, specific uh, characteristic the problem is that after 10 years the risk of abandon by oracle was uh, huge so we took control and relaunched the innovation so today and and i say uh, this unfortunately uh, is a uh, is a big issue but uh, it looks like it's impossible to do anything because the people at apache open office um, are not willing uh, to uh, to recognize that their product has never been a real one uh, and uh, they want to keep alive uh, a dead project uh, with just uh, for the sake of not having a single um, Microsoft Office competitor based on free software. So this uh, is the situation. Today, OpenOffice, Apache OpenOffice is old and LibreOffice is uh, updated and growing. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, there are some clouds uh, under the sun. Uh, it's not, not, not everything is easy, but uh, the reality says that uh, the project is growing and uh, is growing in the right direction. So on September 28, 2010, this was the announcement. We announced the brand LibreOffice. Uh, 
Um, the reason were different. Uh, uh, Libre, of course, uh, as a root in, uh, in the Latin word uh, uh, freedom. And also, uh, LibreOffice uh, at the time was uh, a domain available uh, more or less everywhere in the world uh, without having to buy or uh, start uh, lengthy and uh, expensive uh, uh, legal discussions. Uh, this is the situation uh, 10 months before uh, the fork and uh, 10 months after the fork. It's a uh, uh, research done by Swedish, uh, the Swedish uh, University of uh, Lund. Uh, they have um, analyzed the commits. You see that the 10 months before, this is a pie on the left, uh, you have uh, 66 plus 16 percent, which means uh, over 80 percent of contribution, whereby the open office division plus Sun and only Novell uh, uh, had a kind of visible uh, uh, visible um, uh, contribution on on the code. On the right side, the pie shows that uh, you, we still have. Uh, Sun uh, and uh, an open office contribution, but we start to have a visible uh, amount from Red Hat, a visible amount from SUSE, and uh, several new organizations that never showed up before because they thought uh, that contributing to open office uh, was too difficult, uh, too challenging, and it was not worth the, the effort. Uh, we announced uh, the first version, LibreOffice 3.3. Uh, we, we just decided to follow the open office numbering scheme, numbering scheme at the time at Fosdem 2011, in uh, late January 2011. And when we announced uh, this was our, uh, our uh, um, um, program. So to have uh, a time-based six-month release, uh, that should be synchronized with the Linux distribution cadence, uh, because that is, uh, uh, there are two reasons for this. Of course, uh, uh, we, LibreOffice is probably, uh, is the office suite of choice for uh, most or all uh, Linux distribution first. And second, uh, many of our core developers uh, are involved in in a way or another in in a Linux distribution. So there is a a very close cont contribution uh, and collaboration collaboration between the, the different project. Although the largest number of uh, LibreOffice users, of course, is on Windows. Uh, in addition, uh, we release uh, minor bug fix uh, um, releases. Uh, we usually have. Um, six or seven of them on each uh, for each major release uh, we we will um, uh, we have we have just announced uh, uh, 7.0 actually we announce uh, 7.0.2 and next week uh, we will announce 7.0.3 uh, we have also announced uh, 6.4.7 uh, as we uh, regularly maintain uh, two different uh, versions of the software to have uh, uh, a complete offering. Uh, the, the, the older one is more tested, <clears throat> the newer one has more features. This uh, is the first uh, home page of the Document Foundation. Looks a little bit naive today but the contents are still extremely actual and current. We are uh, reviewing a little bit uh, uh, the, uh, what we call uh, the next decade manifesto because uh, after the first decade, we need a, a new one for the next, for the second decade. But the reason uh, why we announce or the founding principles are uh, exactly this, the good ones. So copyleft license, no contributor agreement, meritocracy, governance by the community, 
um, by contributing, you can become a member of the Document Foundation and you can elect and be elected and vendor independence, which means uh, um, that in any of the two major body of uh, the Document Foundation, Board of Director and Membership Committee, no company can have more than uh, one third of the votes. Uh, these two uh, guarantee diversity and inclusiveness. And of course, uh, uh, to avoid, uh, to fall back uh, into the same situation where uh, we had Sun controlling uh, the uh, community council uh, at open office uh, and at the end taking all decisions, uh, uh, even if um, volunteers were not agreeing completely. Our main, as main asset are developers. Uh, we have developers uh, which are uh, based uh, more or less everywhere in the world. Although we still have a significant number of people in Europe, uh, the project has uh, European roots, as I said, uh, and uh, um, the, 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 the big uh, group uh, of uh, uh, Sun developers was uh, based in, uh, in Hamburg. So what the uh, developers did to make it easy to contribute to LibreOffice, they created uh, what is called uh, the uh, Easy Axe. So they basically uh, took the code and uh, tried to find uh, small tasks that would be easy to uh, to achieve uh, even for uh, newcomers. Uh, the issue is that uh, uh, LibreOffice uh, is uh, over 6 million lines of code. The code uh, uh, in some cases is, uh, is, quite, a is quite old uh, uh, just because as I said, uh, it started 35 years ago. So the, the, in some cases uh, we need to look at all the components and replace them. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, implied a huge mentoring effort. Uh, this is Michael Mix, uh, a senior developer helping a, a younger one. And uh, by, uh, with this strategy of um, having, uh, making it easier, not, not trivial, but easier, uh, contributing to LibreOffice, uh, we managed to increase the number of uh, developers by adding uh, new hackers every month. Uh, uh, this stops at the end of December 2012, uh, but I can tell you that uh, we basically uh, went on adding uh, new developers, two, three, four, or even more per month uh, uh, up to now. Um, with probably um, no, no exceptions, no, no months without uh, new developers. Uh, and this allowed us uh, to make uh, a number, to achieve a number of uh, code uh, uh, clean, cleaning uh, and code refactoring uh, uh, objectives. The first one, uh, was to rewrite completely the build system. And uh, now uh, uh, building LibreOffice is incredibly, is incredibly easy. You just need one command. You can see that we started with 3.3 and uh, we got to the objective in 4.1. Uh, we also added uh, uh, unit test over time. Uh, we need a professional product. And uh, for a professional product, you need uh, to test uh, features. You need to test uh, critical, uh, critical uh, processes. So uh, for instance, uh, loading and, uh, un um, loading and uh, importing and exporting uh, files. These are uh, crashes on import and export. And also, uh, specific test for uh, components. These are uh, uh, tests for uh, calc. Uh, we publish everything. Uh, everything is um, available on the network. Um, 
and uh, we uh, we are completely transparent in the sense and we provide all the information on what we do we also uh, translated german comments uh, open office was born in germany uh, at first it was not supposed to be a global project so uh, developers were not encouraged to comment uh, the code in english and they did it in german because they were german native speakers most of them was german native speaker so the problem on the other end was uh, that by having the, the source code commented in german this would limit uh, the possibility from for people not fluent in german and only fluent in english uh, to contribute to the software so uh, we we re, we uh, there was a group of people uh, fluent in german and of course uh, also in english that helped to clean and translate in english uh, german comments so uh, we we cleaned the, the comments uh, we we did it we, and now they are in english this makes it easy for people to approach libreoffice code and these are the commits by organization during the last couple of years uh, as you can see collabora is the company that provides more um, commits then uh, you have volunteers then you have red hat cib is a german company uh, TDF, uh, the Document Foundation, Munich, uh, and other organization. So this uh, uh, is uh, in terms of uh, number of commits and contributions. We take care, we, we are really serious uh, about security. Uh, so we take care um, of security by using, uh, by doing our own internal analysis and by using third party software when they are available. One of these software is Coverity Scan, which is uh, uh, free to use for open source uh, projects. As you can see, on September 20, 12, 2020, there was only one outstanding uh, uh, issue for over 6 million lines of code. Uh, this uh, is uh, the, the gives you a, a, a comparison. Uh, LibreOffice is at 0 0.00, .00 issues per 1000 lines of course source code and this uh, is uh, steadily the situation since 2015 uh, versus uh, the average of free open source software which is uh, 0.65 and the average of uh, average proprietary software which is uh, 0.71 so we are uh, we have a definitely better quality of uh, of code uh, uh, underneath our uh, um, our banner binaries and of course we use fuzzing uh, tools to uh, to find uh, vulnerabilities so this is google os fuzz uh, is the probably the most known but there are others as well so during the years we had um, several development cycles now we are at 7.0 basically libre with 7.0 uh, libreoffice is uh, is a platform is not a product anymore is a platform because uh, you can find uh, a product uh, who are entirely based on libreoffice technology but they have a different name uh, they use the libreoffice technology they use the LibreOffice engine. Uh, they have a different name because they've been recompiled by a company. Uh, but of course, uh, they support the same uh, open document standards uh, and they, um, they, the approach is uh, the same to, in terms of uh, approach to uh, free software. So what we have achieved in general during these 10 years uh, is a uh, renovation of the software and uh, in general uh, we have paid down uh, substantial technical debt that uh, we inherited from open office when uh, we forked the software in 2010. then uh, let's go to the community the community is an incredibly important uh, component of our of our project uh, these are uh, this is these are the numbers of the community. 
uh, you have uh, development included here, but not just development. So we have around 70 people that are contributing 80% of, uh, more or less 80% of uh, everything. Uh, then we have around 180 contributing around 15% uh, and around 700 contributing 5%. Everyone uh, in this uh, pie chart is uh, important. Some people that are contributing once a year, they may contribute uh, something which is uh, incredibly important, such a uh, turnkey translation for uh, some term which is introduced by a new feature. They can uh, patch, uh, add a security patch, and they are the only one able to do that. So it's not because you are contributing once a year that your contribution are not, are not good enough. Uh, these are contribution on Ask uh, uh, LibreOffice. At the moment, we are evaluating uh, moving to this course here because uh, Ask uh, is uh, not a, a community which is uh, dynamic enough uh, to maintain uh, the software. So we are um, currently evaluating uh, other uh, alternatives. This is, these are uh, the Bugzilla issues by status. Uh, of course, uh, we have, uh, as you can see, bugs uh, uh, which are uh, uh, unfortunately uh, going and coming like for an, every software. Uh, what is important is that the general number is not uh, increasing uh, and actually we are keeping it under control. Uh, Ask and Bugzilla are uh, mostly uh, volunteer contribution. And then we have the largest, uh, probably the largest chunk of volunteer contribution is still not really, uh, we, we have uh, some challenges in, uh, in counting these contributions because uh, in some cases, for instance, um, a localization team uh, uh, in a language, um, there are around a dozen people and only one is committing uh, on the, on the code because he's the one uh, that do all the revisions uh, and has the experience for the final commit. This happens, for instance, for the localization of the Italian language. So uh, we, we are working hard to improve our dashboard to add uh, this kind of uh, counts. Uh, what is in really uh, important is to note that LibreOffice uh, with uh, 119 shipping languages is the software available in more language uh, languages in the world, uh, either uh, open source or proprietary. We, we have uh, another 26 uh, uh, language project uh, under development. So uh, next versions uh, can add uh, some languages. Of course, at this point, uh, they will be uh, niche languages, but in some cases, niche languages are the ones uh, who risk uh, to disappear and having uh, a software that is uh, supporting uh, the, the language is important for the, for the people speaking uh, that language. And this is a geography of, um, of our community. Um, dark green uh, is where we have, uh, we have uh, members. Light green is where we have uh, uh, contributors, uh, but not members. And uh, I think that in Serbia, there should be people that apply for membership. Uh, as you can see, it's light green. Uh, and uh, uh, I would really like uh, to see dark green uh, uh, when uh, hopefully next year I will be with you in uh, in Belgrade for the next ver uh, the next version of uh, your conference. We hope the, to. Thank you. The these are the pictures of our conferences uh, uh, over the years. Uh, uh, in 2020, uh, it uh, just uh, 
finished is uh, uh, in 2019, we even had a bus entitled to the LibreOffice components. And in 2020, it was virtual. Uh, we, we've just finished. Uh, uh, we are uh, uploading uh, our, the talks uh, online. Uh, so you, you will be able, if you did not follow the conference, uh, you will be able to, to listen to talks uh, uh, very soon. And now let's uh, uh, switch uh, to the to the second uh, topic of the presentation. So, uh, technology sovereignty. This uh, I think is important. And uh, as uh, free software advocates, we should uh, start thinking seriously to um, use uh, uh, technology sovereignty as a weapon, as a competitive uh, plus uh, of our uh, solutions. So. Technology sovereignty is the ability to provide the, te the, the strategic technologies to uh, end users, to citizens, without uh, forcing people to buy uh, the solutions uh, from a single company. And how to achieve it uh, is to influence standards, to, uh, to, to get uh, to uh to to be included in uh, in uh, solutions um and uh, uh, that is important especially with the uh, current evolution of data uh, we were used to have data as byproduct of processes and today data is a product itself we are generating a huge 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 amount of data and uh, unfortunately uh, with the uh, by, by not being careful about uh, management of those data, what we end up is to that we give those these data to these companies. Um, and uh, this is not good for us. Uh, and, and of course, it's good for these companies. But I mean, it's uh, uh, I, I wonder if uh, these companies uh, and uh, users interest are really in sync. So how we can regain control of our data? Uh, we really should uh, be able to decide uh, who to share our data with, uh, under which rules, and when and for what purposes. This is what uh, open source software and open uh, document format allow. So uh, of course, uh, we, we can decide this in a uh, let's say based on trust, uh, uh, but uh, if uh, the data are controlled by a monopoly of a few companies, then uh, we risk to lose our collective intelligence. And remember, our collective intelligence uh, is uh, our heritage. It's not companies' heritage, it's our heritage. So we should be extremely careful about protecting our heritage for the future. And, and the answer for that is to use uh, open document format uh, is LibreOffice uh, uh, standard uh, native format and uh, is also an open document format is independent, uh, is interoperable, is neutral and is perennial. I think uh, uh, it's not always easy to understand this, uh, this topic. So I will try to explain this uh, making some examples which are easy to understand. Basic concept is as ODF is solid and robust. ODF is consistent across operating systems. So um, there are no differences if you create ODF uh, uh, in Windows, Mac OS or Linux. Is interoperable and predictable. So at the end is the best standard file format for users of personal productivity software. Um, we are not discussing about uh, which is the best format. Uh, we are discussing about which is the best standard file format. Uh, because the best format, if it's proprietary, is not helping users to uh, protect their heritage in the future. So a digital document uh, can be used only by those who have access to the decoder. With ODF, the decoder is clear. It's easy and uh, it's uh, uh, respecting XML standards and XML uh, 
recognized uh, um, approach. So uh, a digital document should be readable and interpretable uh, uh, as long as possible. Of course, not every user will be able to interpret XML, but technical people are able to interpret XML. Uh, and uh, so they should be able to interpret the document once uh, it has been uh, uh, unzipped uh, and expanded uh, in, uh, in its components. Unfortunately, what happens is that uh, uh, we have a still a severe uh, lock-in issue. We cannot read your documents uh, is a campaign from uh, the Free Software Foundation. But on the, on the right side, you see a real, uh, this is not Photoshop, it's a real document, is the, the cover of a real document created by Microsoft. It's a manual, how to lock in your clients. So how the hell uh, we can uh, trust a company that writes a manual uh, how to lock in your clients? It's not writing a manual about how to uh, outperform uh, uh, our uh, competition. No, it's, uh, they, they don't want to outperform the competition. They want to lock in the, cl the clients. And we realize the importance of standards when, uh, uh, when Tim Berners-Lee at CERN uh, uh, managed to uh, create the HTML format and to keep it independent. Today, you can access any, any uh, kind of website with any browser uh, without, uh, mm, without making a guess about which is the browser that reads better that specific website. There are some hiccups, but the reality is that uh, uh, the vast majority of websites can be accessed by the almost every browser because this is interoperability. And uh, th there are also definitions of interoperability. This is the European interoperability. And of course, uh, Lego is a proprietary, uh, but uh, the concept of interoperability at Lego is absolutely fantastic. I am uh, 66 and 60 years ago, I was uh, playing with Lego bricks uh, that today my nephew who is six uh, uh, is playing with. Of course, uh, uh, we, the, the family during the years has increased the number of available variants of the bricks, uh, but my bricks uh, uh, 60 years old uh, can uh, still interoperate with the bricks uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, purchased uh, last week uh, in a Lego shop, because the interoperability rules uh, are standard. So this is what we should achieve, uh, uh, an interoperable file format where all the software use the same format and can read and save that format without uh, the user worrying about, uh, or um, I may have a risk of reading or not reading that document. And uh, of course, uh, we have uh, two, unfortunately, we have two competing format, uh, ODF uh, and Office Open XML. Uh, that is not the true logo, of course. Uh, this has been uh, created by a Greek uh, uh, volunteer, and um, I'm using it because I had bananas. The only thing that I don't eat at all are bananas. And uh, so for me, having a logo based on bananas is really uh, Office Open XML is as disgusting uh, as I find bananas for me. Uh, first, uh, we have to make it clear that Office Open XML transitional uh, is still uh, the default uh, format, although it was supposed to be deprecated uh, since uh, 2010. Uh, the reality is that uh, as of 2020, uh, the default uh, Office Open XML format uh, that you are using, if you are uh, saving, uh, if you are using Microsoft Office, is the non-standard. Office Open XML transitional is not a standard, is not an ISO standard. Only Office Open XML strict is the ISO standard, but basically it does not exist because uh, 
the option uh, is uh, uh, very well hidden in the Save As menu. And uh, there's no way that uh, Microsoft Office users are educated about using the standard version. In addition, there's no uniform support. So Microsoft Office 20, 2010 doesn't support uh, uh, strict. Uh, the other version supports strict, but the default is transitional. But Microsoft Office uh, for macOS doesn't support strict, and Microsoft Office 365 doesn't support strict. So the reality is that we are, when we talk about Office Open XML, we talk about a proprietary product. The philosophy behind the ODF is completely different. It was built as a vendor neutral. And although uh, one of the, uh, the architects of uh, the ODF uh, was Tim Bray, and Tim Bray was one of the architects of XML, uh, the uh, ODF XML was reviewed by third, independent third parties uh, to have it uh, uh, completely independent uh, from uh, uh, any company. Uh, although, as I say, Tim Bray was one of the architects of XML and probably the main architect in general. The philosophy of uh, Office Open XML is exactly the opposite. is a, is a non-standard document format designed up by Microsoft for Microsoft product to interoperate with Microsoft environment. No uh, thinking uh, uh, has been exercised for interoperability with no Microsoft environment or compliance with established vendor neutral standard. The difference is that ODF has been designed for the next 20 to 50 years and uh, to, to liberate users for the next 20 to 50 years while Office Open XML has been designed to lock in users for the next 20 to 50 years. And uh, if you look at the standardization process, uh, look at the last line. So the F, uh, the description is uh, today is around 1000 pages because there have been additions in 1.2 and 1.3. But anyway, the, the original one was 720 pages reviewed in 1,239 days. And uh, Office of XML, uh, the description was and still is 7,200 pages, and it was reviewed in 838 days. So uh, we are not talking about uh, a, a, a novel. We are talking about the des technical description of a standard. So it, reading 100 and commenting in a sensible way, one more than 100 pages per day, is just impossible. And here you see the speed comparison. You, you see that there's no real uh, uh, possibility of, uh, of affirming that Office Open XML was reviewed professionally. And uh, about the reuse of existing standard, ODF is reusing. Uh, these are the most known, but next slide will show you a little bit more. While Office Open XML is reusing only Dublin Core and has to rewrite, re-describe everything else. So the reason why the description is so bigger is because the Office Open XML uh, it reinvents the wheel uh, for everything, and these are the normative references of ODF. As you can see, uh, there, is, there there is quite a lot more than uh, what I showed you. Is uh, uh, basically if there is a standard component, uh, the standard component has been used in ODF. And now let's look at um, what happens uh, if, I, if I write a text in, uh, in, the, in the two different standards. So I, uh, I've asked your colleagues to, to give me uh, two sentences in, uh, in Serbian uh, to, to, as a reference for me, I've added the the English translation because it's uh, rather difficult for me to to understand uh, the the Serbian. Uh, if uh, and and I've just uh, copied and pasted this uh, as a pure text into doc a, a document. So LibreOffice uh, 
Uh, and uh, I can tell you that I saved it in, uh, in uh, every uh, operating system. So uh, this is the way that the, the four lines are, uh, um, are represented in XML. This is how the same four lines are represented in Microsoft Office Windows, so the desktop version. As you can see, um, uh, I would not call it human readable. Uh, of course, it can be human readable for a technical guy. But for instance, uh, why the hell uh, you have uh, a space into a line? that is not according to any sensible approach to XML. And this is uh, uh, Microsoft Office for Mac OS. As you can see, is uh, uh, rather similar, uh, mm, almost identical. Uh, and this is what happens with 365. This is closer to uh, LibreOffice, but not entirely because uh, for some reason the last uh, the last line has been uh, split in two so it's easy to understand uh, why uh, when i say there's no consistency why i'm saying you that there is no consistency this is not consistent uh, and uh, let's uh, uh, brain and computer so libreoffice uh, let's say that we want to describe that uh, uh, red uh, uh, rectangle for LibreOffice, it will always be format color and, uh, and uh, code color. For Microsoft Office, there will be a different, uh, a different string for uh, each uh, uh, application. In uh, Excel, we'll add 2FF uh, for unknown reason. And uh, in some cases, like the sRGB CLR, uh, um, that is uh, an esoteric uh, XML tag, uh, which has no reason. And then uh, let's switch to dates. Um, Microsoft Office is still uh, um, propagating a 40 uh, plus years old bug, the, uh, the so-called bug of the leap year, according to which uh, uh, 1900 was a leap year, uh, and it was not what it was not. So they they add uh, uh, February 29, 1900 uh, to the uh, to the count. Uh, in addition, they don't save the dates uh, uh, in a human readable format, but as a um, sequential number uh, from uh, January 1st, uh, 1900. So the, in addition, the sequential number of course is wrong because it should be one uh, one number less. So uh, my birthday, that was uh, August 12, uh, uh, 1954, or uh, according to Excel, uh, 1948, uh, should actually be 1947. But the reality is that if you open the Excel XML, that is the date. And uh, I wouldn't call uh, that number as human readable by any mean. And uh, XML offers some design advantages and these are entirely respected by ODF and not respected by Office Open XML. In fact, they have a poor XML for a number of reasons. I'm going fast on this because you can then read the slides. There's no reason I spend time on each one of these. Uh, the uh, length of tag naming uh, is also uh, a difference uh, and uh, is not uh, uh, is, is a disadvantage for Office Open XML. And let's say that we compare this uh, document is a, is a false text. So it's a lorem ipsum. It's a, as you can see, it's a two page text with a uh, bulleted list on the first page and, uh, and a table on the second page. So uh, let's say, uh, let's count uh, the length of the XML lines. So um, LibreOffice 1.2, I didn't count 1.3 yet, but I'm sure it's not going to be really different. 
it's it's always around 222 i i got one time uh, 224 but it's uh, absolutely comparable the the funny thing is that uh, with microsoft office according to the version you go up and down uh from 1040 uh, lines to 12000 down to 1500 up to 11000 down to 7000 and which is worse is that uh, uh, th these are uh, main references but if we look at the uh, at the each uh, uh, version so 2013 according to the season the length of the uh, XML is changing. Of course, uh, I'm joking on this and say uh, that Microsoft Office uh, users want to have the possibility of showing uh, their preferred seasonal uh, fashion uh, uh, format, like they would uh, wear a Gucci or a Calvin Klein uh, um dress uh, but this is uh, uh, you know it's a sad uh, smile because the reality is that people uh, is not aware of this situation and they continue to use a format that locks them in because of the fact that there are uh, such a huge difference in length uh, means that at the end users are locked in uh, into that format so Naive deductions or LibreOffice developers geniuses and all Microsoft Office are, uh, let's say, idiots. The real uh, deduction is that uh, the artificial complexity of uh, Office Open XML, which is the result of a number, as you understand, is a number of um, uh, decisions. Uh, which are not just the length of the XML, but how the XML is structured, how the, 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 the syntax is used, uh, is uh, created to protect uh, uh, a market which is still uh, uh, worth more than $25 billion. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, using a standard office uh, uh, document uh, would uh, create issues for Microsoft uh, in protecting uh, this uh, this market, because uh, there was there won't be any reason to use uh, that format if you have uh, another format available which is better, more solid, more robust, and gives you full interoperability. So the reality is that we have a simple an, an approach based on simplicity versus an approach based on hidden complexity. And uh, the hidden complexity, unfortunately for Microsoft, brings uh, uh, security issues. So this is a research uh, from 2011, Symantec, for the German uh, government. As you can see, there are PPT, DOC, uh, XLSX, uh, uh, XLS, uh, RTF, and PDF. These are the documents which are used in targeted attacks, which means uh, documents that are used to carry viruses, ransomware, Trojans, whatever. In uh, uh, Kaspersky, end of 2018, uh, actually fourth quarter of 2018, as you can see, uh, PDF went down uh, to almost zero office went up to 70%. It means that at the end of two, in the last quarter of 2018, 70% of all malware was carried by an office document. So this uh, is uh, uh, a consideration for people using office documents, just that. Um, two myths uh, and then uh, I will uh, end uh, my presentation. So the first one, Microsoft will tell you that Office Open XML is better documented. It's false. More than 80% of Office Open XML use documentation is used to reinvent the wheel. Describe proprietary Microsoft format. Describe Office Open XML incredibly complex XML schema, which is not following any XML convention. 
and describe proprietary elements uh, of legacy MSO for formats, which are not part of the ISO standard. Second myth, Office Open XML is backward compatible. No, truth is exactly the opposite. Office Open XML is backward compatible with legacy proprietary Microsoft Office format, but not with Office Open XML standard docs, which do not exist, as I said. And uh, in addition, Office Open XML files are not versioned and they are not consistent over time, uh, probably because of different version if they were documented. And 100% of them is still proprietary on Office XML transitional. So uh, I'm making a, 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 uh, an equivalence here to close my presentation. Uh, you know, Plato was saying that man is an animal with two legs and no feathers. And uh, uh, Diogenes said, uh, this is Plato's man. It's basically a chicken without feathers and two legs. And I can't, what I can tell you is that uh, Office Open XML is uh, to a standard format like the chicken is uh, to uh, a man, is uh, uh, to Plato's man. So basically, by cheating people, they can consider that, but the reality is completely different. Last slide, this is almost unbelievable, but uh, we are so uh, uh, dependent to Microsoft that uh, in 2020, uh, scientists renamed human gene because Excel was not able to uh, manage them in the proper way. And uh, so I think that this is a testament uh, to the insanity that we are uh, currently uh, experiences with, experiences with Microsoft. Um, last thing uh, is uh, about LibreOffice versions and LibreOffice 7 uh, and the user base estimate. I think uh, uh, you can have a look at that. Uh, uh, I want to leave you uh, some space for questions. And uh, so thank you for uh, listening to me. It was a pleasure to, to present. Uh, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, I will uh, show my face so that if you want to ask uh, questions. Thank you for listening so far. And I hope it was interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a small audience here, around 15 people. Maybe you can see some of them behind myself. Yes. Um, and we have one question from the audience and I would ask uh, our attendee uh, to present a question. I'll just forward camera to him. Uh, <clears throat> so Italo, thank you for uh, this very interesting uh, talk. We really do appreciate your openness and uh, directness, which I would sum up as liberness. So uh, I, have, I would have a, a, a two questions. So first question is, how do you comment on the, on the, on the format that is used by other, uh, let's say cloud providers, like, like let's say Google Docs, I believe they are using open document format and how that aligns to, to, towards what you speak. And the second one is uh, we see a global trend in this cloud uh, 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 suits like uh, Office uh, 365 and then Google Docs. So I was just wondering whether LibreOffice has uh, some um, aspirations towards the cloud, uh, etc. And the last comment towards the genes, uh, if, if we are uh, renaming genes uh, to, to better suit Excel, uh, maybe it is a devolution, not not evolution as as we are seeing. Thank you very much. Yes, I totally agree on on the genes. That is insanity, because uh, it's uh, it shouldn't happen. I mean, uh, a company cannot uh, cannot condition uh, uh, science in general. No company, uh, whatever. In terms of um, format used by other uh, office suites, uh, um, the reality is that. Uh, uh, everyone uh, tries to mimic uh, the behavior of Microsoft Office. Uh, it's uh, uh, 
the reality uh, is that uh, everyone is using uh, reverse engineering. There's no other way. Um, it's a standard format. So uh, reverse engineering should not be part of the picture because uh, if it's standard, you just follow the rules. But the fact is that the rules are so complicated that uh, everyone is using reverse engineering. So there are flows uh, here and there. Of course, what happens is that there are um, office suites uh, that use uh, Office of XML as their native uh, format. So they, um, when when uh, when an office suite uh, uh, suite uh, open a file, usually the uh, the format in uh, in in RAM is uh, uh, close to the native format of the the suite. So LibreOffice. Uh, our working format is very similar to ODF, while uh, um, for other suite, uh, it's uh, similar to Office Open XML. This can be an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, in this area perfection exists because, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, creating filters for formats is not trivial, it's not easy. It's a lot easier to create that for ODF than for Office of an XML. But anyway, I prefer not to comment on the challenge. The problem is that uh, uh, instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, promoting uh, the use of standard, which would be an advantage for everyone, of course, it's not an advantage for Microsoft, but let's say that if Google and all the others were supporting ODF, uh, not only on paper, because on paper they support ODF, but in the reality, they, they would support ODF. Uh, then uh, a larger number of people would realize the advantage of having ODF, of having a, a true standard. Um, and in this case, I'm not just uh, talking about ODF. It's uh, because ODF is, it happens to be the only standard, but could be another format. Let's say the advantage is to use an open standard. The open standard, if in de deployed by everyone, will basically bring interoperability issues to zero or close to zero. So if I send you a, let's say that we, we speak two different languages and let's say that you send me a document in uh, written in Serbian, uh, with translation in English. And if uh, you send it by, uh, using uh, ODF, uh, I will, uh, even if I don't understand, I will see the Serbian part without any change in relation to what you've written. And then I can edit the English, send it back to you. But at the end, you will get the Serbian part without any disruption, any change. And uh, it would be the same if I send you a you know, a document part in Italian and part in English. And uh, so the, the, the actually the, the, the contents we, are, we have are exactly the same, what the user want to propagate. With a, with a non-standard, you have the contents that the software wants to propagate, not the user, the software. And uh, uh, for some people that may be, you know, convenient. They don't like uh, dealing with software, but this is because we, we should educate them in understanding that dealing with software today is something that they cannot avoid. It's like, uh, you know, I, uh, when, I, when I wrote my thesis, I, my, my, deg I, my degree is in 1978. There was no computer at the time. So my, my thesis was typewritten. And uh, uh, that was the only thing I could do. And the only way I could uh, interoperate was with photocopies. But today, it's just stupid to think that I have to photocopy something or give you the printed copy to interoperate because we should avoid printing paper and using paper. So that is uh, the real, it's a, it's, a, it's a cultural issue. We should. Uh, uh, all uh, try to educate other people. Uh, and last thing, uh, uh, LibreOffice Online is uh, available. The name is not LibreOffice Online, it's CollaboraOffice uh, Online. Uh, as I said, LibreOffice is a platform. So we uh, there is a, a, a product 
which fulfills that area. Uh, and uh, uh, people should look at that product uh, uh, for their needs. Of course, uh, um, it's uh, something that needs uh, an infrastructure. So you need either uh, next cloud, open cl uh, own cloud or some other infrastructure uh, underneath because uh, uh, if you don't have the infrastructure it's not a standalone product. Thank you very much. And we love to see you in Belgrade next year. I hope also, I need to, to you see my face, I need to, to keep this uh, full face uh, to, to taste some uh, Serbian uh, food. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll set up that. Thanks. Thank you, Itala. Uh, we have more questions from the audience here, but I would just like to read you. Uh, we have also something in Q&A. Yeah. Um, Milica Cepic said it's just a comment. Great explanation of the difference between genuinely open formants and those merely pretending to be open. Unfortunately, many people still, still believe that Microsoft tools are open only because they are widely used. This is highly relevant in the context of data, including research data, archiving, curating, and sharing. I also agree with this. And we have a question um, where presentation can be found. I, I believe I can say that you agree that we place this somewhere online, maybe on YouTube and Zenodo. Uh, absolutely, you are free to put it everywhere you want, uh, and I will send you the the PDF of the slides uh, uh, after the the talk, so you can publish it on your website. No problem at all. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, 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 about the, the first question, I think uh, is a responsibility of all open source advocates uh, to to uh, really explain people. I know it's, uh, it's not easy because people will tell you, yeah, but everyone is using Microsoft, okay. Uh, but uh, during our, uh, you know, during our existence, we have done uh, some insane things. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that there's no country in the world that can say that there have not been times of the history that they've done insane things and everyone was doing these insane things uh, and this is the, by doing insane things is, is because everyone was doing them uh, is not a justification of continuing to do that i mean we we know what happened uh, in the balkans uh, uh, you know what happened in italy 70 years ago with the fascism you know we all uh, had uh, huge issues and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, just perpetuating the issues because everyone is doing this it's uh, I mean that is not human that is just stupid uh, and uh, we should tell people uh, okay you you change I mean we, for 20 years uh, let's say that we have sl been sleeping for 20 years uh, but now that we are uh, awake uh, we should uh, realize that it's our advantage to use open formats and uh, we we protect ourselves it's not we, we we don't go it's not that we go we are against uh, someone we protect uh, ourselves users i protect myself uh, and i protect uh, the other guy when if i use uh, an open format and you if we all do the same that is a big advantage for everyone I agree to that. Thank you. I will just uh, switch the camera so that you can hear more questions from the audience. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much for your presentation. Actually, much better than I expected, although I expected a really good presentation. I feel much better because uh, you spoke loudly, spoke out loudly, um, uh, opinions that I share, especially regarding practices of a company, and I don't dare to mention. So really, I enjoy it and feel much better. Actually, just a short question regarding math module in uh, LibreOffice, because I use a lot of math. And when it comes to math, this is the only point where I find that I need uh, LaTeX. And uh, other than that, uh, LibreOffice uh, is sufficient for all of my needs. So what's going on with math module? What we can expect? Uh, is there any improvement? Are there any improvements or research in that area? 
just curious, not a big deal. Still, LibreOffice is a great tool, and I use it on a regular basis every day. Thank you very much. So, honestly speaking, uh, I think uh, that uh, math uh, um, is not really maintained properly. Um, the problem is that the number of users of um, such a module, especially if we look at the entire number of, uh, of users, uh, is limited because it's a module used for uh, um, scientific notation. So it's uh, not everyone is, is using that. Um, I think uh, the, uh, I mean, I don't know how difficult it could be to, to, to work at improving math. I'm sure that if someone shows up and uh, wants to put some love on math, uh, the developers would be very happy to, to help uh, the person to, to go through the code and, uh, and, and improve it. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's by, by any means uh, is an area where uh, I really do not want to give uh, any, any specific personal opinion because I don't use math. Uh, I have a degree in humanities, uh, so uh, and I profoundly respect people using LaTeX. For me, is uh, mission impossible. You know, even probably worse than Tom Cruise. And uh, so um, I I know that there are some limitations. On one end, uh, math uh, is uh, based on uh, MathML, which is a standard. Uh, on the other end, of course. Uh, uh, we are missing some love uh, on that module, but sorry, I I can ask uh, the developers. I can send you an email if I get something better than what I could answer. Yeah, okay, that's great already. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Thank you. And we are having next question. Um, we are entering a bit of break, but I think that's really fine. It's interesting, so we won't stop here. <laughs> Mr. Brignoli, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, I would have two questions. The, the first related to the first part of your presentation, actually. You mentioned that you have uh, around uh, 70 or 80 core developer contributors, and then three times more uh, regular and even 10 times more uh, casual. Uh, could you tell us more about the, the process, how many of your uh, core developers are needed to handle the, the rest of the guys? Or? But actually, difficult, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, let's say that a developer needs uh, some mentoring uh, when it starts uh, contributing in a substantial way. So um, uh, many of these uh, are already uh, rather independent and, um, and do not need mentoring. We uh, try to use uh, as much as we can uh, opportunities uh, and uh, for instance, we use this year, it was impossible, but in, uh, we try to organize uh, uh, ACFEST uh, on a regular basis during the year. And uh, we invite at ACFEST uh, young developers uh, because that is a very good opportunity to sit uh, close to a core developer. We use uh, uh, Google Summer of uh, Code. And of course, Google Summer of Code allows us to shorten the uh, the learning curve because uh, uh, people uh, uh, also mentors get a stipend uh, to assist the user so they uh, because uh, at the end of the day a developer has to pay uh, electricity and so on and so forth and has to pay the food so uh, we cannot think that and basically mentoring is uh, always done uh, on a volunteer basis. So we cannot ask a core developer to work full-time at mentoring. They probably can devote a couple of hours per day, but not more than that. So we use uh, Google Summer of Code. Uh, now we use also Google Summer of Documentation, uh, so GSOD. Uh, and uh, we are uh, uh, discussing about uh, having uh, virtual ACFEST uh, for 2021, because uh, uh, although we all would like uh, to to meet person in person, uh, I don't think uh, 
is going to be possible uh, at least for the first uh, six months of 2021. So we we will uh, we will organize some event uh, to make it easier for uh, people to 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 you know to to flatten the, the learning curve. That is, uh, and uh, the numbers are uh, have always been more or less the same. When we started, uh, we had a little bit more contributors. So in 2010. Uh, but then uh, I can say that from 2013, 14 uh, onwards, uh, the numbers are uh, have been always more or less the same. So I think, uh, of course, uh, uh, having more developers uh, would not be bad. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, then coordinating more developers uh, would uh, there would be a bigger effort. So um, we have to balance. Uh, the two needs of having more developers and uh, uh, having uh, also core developers focus on uh, doing their work and not just on mentoring uh, the newcomers. Yes, thank you. And the uh, second question is not actually related to your presentation, so, but uh, I'm interested in your opinion uh, or your aspect, how do you see the situation? You're deeply involved in software industry and uh, open source industry actually has a lot of contributors. How about, what do you think, what we can expect in the following 30 or 50 years for not only software industry, but other types of industries, food industries and openness, uh, open source food industries or pharmaceuticals or car, car manufacturers? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that uh... The first thing that that we have to solve in this area is to, we have to educate people about the advantages of sharing uh, knowledge. Um, if we go back, uh, the, you know, if we go back 500 years or even more, uh, if you rem remember the or if you happen to have seen uh, some frescoes, uh, uh, there is the School of Athens uh, by Raffaello that is uh, in the uh, Vatican Museum, which is very famous. And uh, at the time of Greek people, people was sharing their ideas without any, any, you know, copyright was basically non-existing. People was sharing their ideas. Uh, and uh, then we have built uh, an industry based on scarcity uh, to protect uh, the interest of someone, uh, but I think that uh, we went uh, too much uh, into that direction. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we are overprotecting people and uh, not uh, helping uh, people uh, to share their, uh, their contents. And today, with a majority of uh, digital content being created and shared, we should have a completely different approach uh, and uh, be more uh, open uh, to sharing uh, our um, information. Uh, of course, uh, that could be with food, uh, with sharing recipes. Uh, and if you think that already people shares a lot of recipes uh, and uh, that's basically uh, what makes the difference is the ability of the chef uh, to, to deploy the recipe more than knowing the elements of the recipe. And so they, the, for everything, we should have more the concept that uh, uh, we should share the information and then our ability of uh, being heard uh, is uh, based on uh, how good we are in interpreting the information and providing our own point of view, which is a challenge but uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm. Let's say that being an old guy, I'm not overly confident on uh, this evolution. I've seen uh, uh, a lot more uh, possibility of sharing information when I was young than today that I'm old. And uh, this uh, and. The reality is that the, the situation should be exactly the opposite. So I, I, I was um, in school in 1968. I was in high school. 
and sharing the information at the time and one of the reason of the 1968 uh, let's call it revolution happen was exactly because people could share their uh, information and now the school uh, doesn't make it as easy as it was in 68 so and i think uh, sorry it, after 40 years it should have gone exactly in the opposite direction so today we should be able to share everything uh, and uh, we have the tools to share but uh, people is uh, uh, creating uh, artificial limitation to sharing be formats be control of uh, sharing platforms uh, and we should be more careful in this um, i hope uh, at least until i will be alive i will share all i've learned during my life because i think that this uh, is what uh, old people should do otherwise uh, an old people that doesn't share what he has learned uh, is just burning oxygen and uh, doesn't making and not making any advantage for others and i would like to avoid being only a oxygen burner for the rest of my life thank you much appreciated very little thank you for all your uh, answers and questions we have uh, one comment and one question if you agree uh, to answer sure. this question, there is um, time for that. From Voice Lavrisivovic, great presentation. Thank you very much. And from Gordana Savic, for companies, the main advantage of ODF is easiness of searching the content of huge amount of documents. Do LibreOffice think to add this or similar functionality as separate tools to advantage over Amazon? But the reality is that we already have uh, that kind of, um, there are tools that already allow to do this. So why we should uh, add tools uh, when tools are already available? We have uh, search engines that can um, easily be configured to look into, into XML. So why we should, uh, don't fall into the same trap, sorry. Uh, we, we should avoid to reinvent the wheel. Uh, if we want to create a, a module that, uh, uh, or an extension, that is welcome. Um, use uh, a, an open source uh, search engine. There is Lucene, but there are others as well. Uh, make it uh, uh, possible for that search engine to to, to look into the zip document it's rather easy technically speaking and uh, uh, and add a module that searches the xml that's not a problem but do not expect libreoffice to reinvent the wheel when the wheel exists like uh, adding uh, an uh, email uh, an email module we already have thunderbird why we should have uh, libreoffice doing what thunderbird is already doing uh, almost perfectly, at least for me, but then of course everyone can can have his own opinion. So um, it's uh, what, what LibreOffice has to do is to push forward ODF as a standard and make it sure that ODF will never go against the principles it was created and developed for. So openness. So. I think that our, if, if you want our uh, task uh, as uh, the, at the moment, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the people behind ODF uh, is to make sure that ODF uh, doesn't give up uh, on its principles. All the rest uh, is add on, uh, use what exists, uh, do not recreate the wheel. It's, uh, that is a that is a trap. Sorry, uh, that we usually fall uh, because we see what the proprietary company do. Uh, don't fall into the same trap. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, it was a great pleasure to hear you. Me too. <laughs> and we definitely have to do this again in person next year. So. Um, 
goodbye stay well thank you thank you for uh, for having me and uh, i enjoy the rest of your conference and uh, i really let, let's hope to be able to meet uh, in belgrade next week that will be my second time in belgrade i spent one night at the belgrade camping uh, in 1981. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you prefer camping, we can organize something, but I believe. No, no, but I, 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 I was a lot younger at the time. And uh, with my wife, we were on our way to, mm -hmm. to Greece. And uh, we wanted to visit uh, many of your uh, uh, monuments, of your. Um, I remember uh, there are some uh, Gracianica and uh, Studenica churches, uh, uh, and I love that that period of art. So I we went through the the former Yugoslavia at the time to visit all that those places. Okay, I will be very happy to be back. Um, thank you. Thank you.